Welcome to Thin ASMR. I hope you've been enjoying my channel and I would like to take this time to discuss one of the most surprisingly underrated tales from the early history of Europeans in America. This should have been a big Hollywood production. The story is better than Dances with Wolves as far as a fish out of water type of story and also as far as stories of European and Native relations as they've made plenty of movies like that. I'm very surprised that they've never made this one because this one is a dandy. The only movie that's actually ever been made about this uh, story is actually a Mexican film. It's uh, completely in Spanish so if you happen to get a copy of it prepare to watch subtitles unless you happen to be bilingual but since we don't have that benefit of a modern day film production, I highly recommend reading A Land So Strange. Uh, it's a book by Andres Resendez. It's about the Narvaez and Cabeza de Vaca expedition. Also, there's a documentary that happens to be located on Daily Motion called All the World is Human. I recommend looking that up that's actually where I first heard the story. It's one of the most interesting documentaries that I've ever watched. So now we're going to go back in time and talk about the Narvaez expedition and the story of Cabeza de Vaca as well. So in Spain, Panfilo Narvaez, who was a veteran in the conquest of Cuba here, in 1528, he was recruited by the King of Spain to explore and conquer parts of northern Mexico over here. And later, he was planning to establish colonies in all of those places along the Gulf of Mexico. But his ships sailed out of Seville and made several stops, including Santo Domingo on the island of Hispaniola. Santiago on the island of Cuba, Trinidad also on the island of Cuba, and finally Havana where they decided to sail to Mexico from. And it should have been a fairly easy trip from Havana to Mexico, and it would not have really been too bad except that the captain who was in charge, the captain of the ship made a terrible mistake and completely miscalculated their route to Mexico. He actually missed that calculation by more than 900 miles because he did not account for the intense Gulf Stream. They were pushed north towards Florida. So they ended up on the west coast on April 12th of 1528 near modern day Tampa Bay. So as they land right here in Tampa Bay, they found a poor landscape with swamps and hostile natives. And this is where our story picks up on this map. It's a very interesting map because it actually shows the tribes and actually shows uh, La Florida, as they called it, as it was at the time. So as they're in Tampa Bay, Narvaez decided that he would get all of his horsemen and his able-bodied soldiers to march on land towards the north on an overland route. And then the sailors and captives would sail north and they would rendezvous up here in Appalachia because they had heard from some of the natives the, of these Tokabaga tribe here near Tampa Bay. They had heard that there was gold in Appalachia and it was a very well populated area. Narvaez liked the sound of that because essentially what he was trying to do was recreate Cortez's magic in Mexico anyway so uh, 
any chance for getting gold and getting any kind of further type uh, rewards to take back to Spain. Narvaez was very interested in that. So they continued heading north as the, the ships headed north as well with the hopes of rendezvousing. So as they're trudging through Florida, through this land, uh, the Spaniards had many challenges getting food. As they cross this river right here, which is called the Withlacoochee River, it's still there today. It's south of modern day Ocala, near Bushnell, Florida. The natives of that area took the Spaniards as a threat, immediately attacking them. But the Spaniards did manage to get the upper hand. The positive that came out of it for Narvaez's men was that the natives that they just uh, dominated had plenty of maize. So the Spanish were able to procure that maize from them and it likely saved the Spaniards from starvation. But the negative that came out of that was that there became a growing rift between Narvaez and his men. They were scared since they were in this land, uh, land route that they were taking. They were afraid that they would never be able to meet up with the ships. This actually ended up turning out to be very justifiable fear. So they did uh, ask Narvaez if they would allow them to send some scouts to the coast down here so that they could ensure that they were close by where the ships were. Narvaez for his part was like, I just wanna get up here to Appalachia. I don't really care. We'll, we'll, we'll find them again, I'm not worried. Because in his mind, they were, they were in Mexico and the ships would end up running into him eventually. Well, finally, as they, they kept going and they didn't spot any ships, he finally did consent, send a contingent of men, um, which included his treasurer, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Baca, to try to find the ships. So they weren't successful finding these ships at all. So Narvaez said, okay, we're gonna just get to Appalachia. We can at least get some gold and get something good out of this expedition. So as they were continuing in that direction, they encountered the Ustaga tribe up here. The Ustaga lived near modern day Lake City, Florida, which is just north of Gainesville. And as it turned out, the Ustaga were actually enemies of the Appalachia. So the Ustaga were very eager to point Narvaez and his men towards the Appalachie, hoping that eventually they would be able to gain an upper hand against them. So as Narvaez and his men started entering the outskirts of the Appalachie territory, Cabeza de Baca and the others were feeling very relieved. As Cabeza de Baca later wrote, on finding ourselves where we desired to be, and where they told us there was so much food and so much gold, it had seemed to us that a great portion of our hardship and weariness had been lifted from us. At this point, it had been a full year since their expedition had originally departed from Spain. So as they're in Appalachian territory, they entered a village, and in that village, there was very few men. The village had mostly women and children. So the Spaniards took the women and children and insisted that they would only release them if the chief would be traded as a hostage. They were successful in getting that trade for the chief, but the outcome did not work out very well for the Spaniards. The natives resorted to guerrilla tactics. So as they're in this village, they stayed there for 25 days. They were able to feed off of corn that had been captured from the natives, but there was absolutely no gold to speak of. So then Narvaez decided 
okay, we're going to need to save ourselves rather than continuing the search for gold. So they heard about a village down in this area in modern day, near modern day Apalachicola. The village was called Aute, spelled A-U-T-E. They were hoping that they could resupply there and they still had an outside chance or a thought of possibly rendezvousing with their ships. But the ships, unfortunately, were still unaccounted for. The trip to Ayut was filled with many problems. The Spaniards ended up in nearly impassable swamps. The swamps were chest deep. And the men were also ambushed by natives. After nine days, the Spanish reached Ayut, but the village had actually been purposely burned to the ground. The natives were perfectly aware of what the Spaniards were up to. In addition, 40 of Narvaez's men came down with typhoid. The expedition lost many. So at this point, their numbers were dwindled down to about 250, and they were heading closer to the Gulf of Mexico, hoping to find the ships. They found the bay there to be very shallow, which concerned everyone greatly because they were thinking the ships would never get there. So the men became further discouraged. So I'm going to take this point to go right back to the original map that we looked at. So here we are in September 1528 in Appalachie Bay. And I want to take a brief moment to talk about what happened to the ships. So the ships that were supposed to rendezvous with Narvaez had their own problems. As they were searching for Narvaez, Narvaez had ordered the ships to sail to Mexico to wait for the overland party. But Narvaez was totally unaware that they were thousands of miles away from Mexico at the time. And the sailors eventually figured it out that they were nowhere near Mexico. And they realized the chances of them running into Narvaez were slim to none. So one of the ships came back to Cuba to get additional supplies. And it did so and rejoined the other ships up in Tampa Bay. The ships searched for Narvaez and his men for a full year, but never found them. So they assumed Narvaez and his men dead at this point. And as we were saying earlier, Narvaez and his men were up here at Appalachie Bay, which they called the Bay of Horses. They called Appalachie Bay the Bay of Horses because they survived there by eating their own horses. They also started melting their armor down to make nails for the purposes of building rafts to sail to Mexico. So by this point, they had completely given up on ever finding the ships, and they were determined to commit themselves to just survival at this point. So the rafts here on Appalachie Bay, they loaded them down with their provisions and supplies of fresh water. Cabeza de Baca later recounted, and so greatly can necessity prevail that it made us risk going in this manner and placing ourselves in a sea so treacherous and without any one of us who went having any knowledge of the art of navigation. So here, once in the open sea, the raft started sailing west. They sailed west for a full month before their rations started running low. As bad as it was that they had lost their rations, that wasn't the worst part. Their biggest challenge was the lack of water. Five days after their fresh water ran out, the men decided to drink seawater, which turned out being a very poor decision. 
The intake of the seawater drove many of the men insane as that actually accelerates dehydration. And to make it worse, a storm started carry, carrying them towards the Mississippi River. So here at the mouth of the Mississippi, they were still 600 miles away from northern Mexico. The river, with its very strong current, pushed them out into the open sea. The rafts became separated and exhausted. And we pick up here on the Texas coast. After passing the Mississippi River, the men were pushed towards the Texas coast. And they were still a long way away from northern Mexico where they were trying to get. But many of the rafts, in fact, some of the rafts made landfall down here in the Corpus Christi, Texas area. Some of the crews of, the, of that raft immediately got attacked by the Camon native tribe. And it took some of the men captive, but almost all of them, other than but very few, had um, been killed. There were two other rafts up here in this area that included Narvaez, and those rafts made it to Matagorda Bay, which is what it's called, modern-day Matagorda Bay. Narvaez attempted to assert his authority over those two rafts and ordered the men to camp on shore. And then while Narvaez and the rest of the men remained on the raft. A storm blew Narvaez's raft out to sea. While he was out to sea, all of the provisions were on shore, so Narvaez and his lieutenants died. And then there were, there were two other rafts remaining that ended up on Galveston Island up here. And those rafts would contain what would be the only survivors of the expedition. So while they're up here on Galveston Island, the Kapok tribes uh, had observed the, the condition of the Spaniards. The Spaniards were in very poor condition, close to death due to starvation. They were cold from the ocean and near hypothermia. The natives observing all this began to understand their condition because they had also seen some of the dead Spaniards who had actually drowned. Cabeza de Baca recounted this encounter with the Capoque by saying, with great grief, they felt pity on us after seeing us in such a state. They all began to weep loudly and so sincerely that they could be heard a great distance away. To see these men lacking so in reason and so crude in the manner of brutes grieve so much for us, it increased in me and others the magnitude of our suffering. So you can kind of hear in that explanation two or three different things. First of all, that the Spaniards were in horrible condition. Second of all, Cabeza de Baca and his men thought of the natives as being brute and being savage. So you can kind of detect a little bit of racism in there. But of course, we're talking about the 16th century and Cabeza de Baca, just like many of his time, were a product of their time. But the Spaniards were in such poor condition that they had really no choice but to trust the natives. And most of them did trust the natives. The natives carried the Spaniards away from the beach and built a fire. And some of the Spaniards refused to go. Cabeza de Baca later said that they 
were fearing that the natives would sacrifice them. But as for the ones who went with the natives willingly, the natives gave them more food and continued to treat them kindly. Some of the men that had remained on the beach attempted another attempt to raft to Mexico, but they died in that attempt. The remaining men struggled to survive as winter took hold. So by spring of 1529, only 15 of the 80 marooned men remained alive on Galveston Island. But those 15 men were continuing to struggle and the natives started having an expectation of them to pull their weight to assist their tribe. This was a problem for the Spaniards, however, because they were not skilled hunters. So the Capokes decided that they would enslave them and leave them to do sort of odd jobs such as carrying firewood and fetching water. The Spaniards, who initially had refused to stay with the natives and remained on the beach, cannibalized each other, which made the natives very appalled, ironically. The natives, for their part, began developing dysentery, likely from decomposing bodies of the Spaniards that had died. Almost half the natives that were on Galveston Island died. As a result, the natives did not trust the Spaniards and wanted to kill them. Cabeza de Baca did manage to intervene and convince the natives to uh, spare their lives. So the natives actually did agree to spare their lives if the Spaniards would agree to be their slaves. The survivors were poorly treated during their time with the Capokes. They were getting killed. As Cabeza de Baca said, they would kill us for daring to go from one house to the other. So in summer of 1529, Cabeza de Baca was taken by his new masters up here to the mainland to Mahalo. Cabeza de Baca took that opportunity to escape to an enemy tribe called the Chirucos. And while he was with the Chirucos, he successfully convinced them to let him act as a traitor with the other tribes. So he was going to the Chirucos, he was going to the Capokes, he was going to other tribes and acting as a traitor. Surprisingly, they agreed to this. He helped them trade uh, their pearls that they had gathered for hides with other tribes. And Cabeza de Baca did this for a total of three years. While, while he was doing this for three years, he took the opportunity to communicate with some of the other Spaniards that had survived. He worked very stealthily trying to convince them to flee the area and head down here towards Mexico. So the, another tribe they fled to was the Miriamas tribe. They were located over here near um, San Antonio. And while they were there, Cabeza de Baca and some of the other survivors became the first Europeans to ever encounter buffalo. Cabeza de Vaca later remarked that their meat was better than beef. But in spite of all this, their time with the Mariamis wasn't all that good. The Mariamis enslaved them and made them work hard. In September of 1534, the four survivors with the Miriamis over here on the Nueces River escaped from, from the Miriamis tribe and they headed south. And as they're heading south, they encounter more hostile tribes. But the good news about this was they were able to use their previous knowledge that they encountered from the other natives and they pretended to be medicine men. The men would demonstrate typical native medicine men behavior 
while they were encountering these natives, but they made one alteration. The men would say the Lord's Prayer and make the sign of the cross to pray for healing. This actually worked for the men, and the natives all around began bringing their sick to Cabeza de Baca. And one of the other castaways later recounted, In this way Jesus Christ guided us, and in his infinite mercy was with us, opening up roads where there were none. In the hearts of men so savage and untamed, God moved to humility and obedience. So after being among all these different tribes as medicine men, the men continued traveling south and ended up at the Rio Grande River, which Cabeza de Baca noted that the river was wider than the Guadalquivir and Seville. So at this point, after crossing the Rio Grande, they were very close to Mexico, or at least where the Spanish civilizations were at the time in Mexico probably no more than a hundred miles. But interestingly enough, Cabeza de Vaca and his men decided to turn west. They had heard uh, from other native tribes that there were other tribes that needed their medicine men services. So they decided to, to head west along this trail here which the trail is called the Corn Trail. It runs parallel to the Sierra Madre Mountains here in Mexico. It was actually a very heavily traveled native route. And after following this trail, the men were led to a village called Junta de los Rios. And by this time, it was November of 1535. Uh, Junta de los Rios is located near modern-day Presidio, Mexico. So while they were here in Junta de los Rios, the men observed what could be called a very advanced native civilization. There were very sturdy homes in this area that overlooked cornfields. The men found this area very refreshing but they decided they would keep following the Rio Grande River along the Corn Trail. So they continued following the river in a northwest fashion and then eventually after crossing the Rio Grande they ran into some other natives and by Christmas of 1535 the men spotted, spotted a Spanish buckle that was tied around the neck of a native. They talked to the native and inquired about the buckle. The native explained that it was traded by some men who wore beards. At this point they knew that Spanish civilization had to be close, so they asked the native where, they, where the native had encountered the men and pointed them towards the Pacific. So they decided to head sort of in a southern route towards the Pacific Ocean. The survivors started following that path and kept following along between the Pacific and the Sierra Madre Mountains. And by April 1536, near the city of Culiacan, the four ragged castaways ended their journey and it sounded something like this. There were four Spanish slave traders on horseback that saw natives walking barefoot and clad in skins. So in the distance they spotted these supposed natives. The natives seemed somewhat ordinary except rather than running away from slave traders as natives normally would do. They were heading straight towards the slave traders. So as the men approached, they noticed one man out of the group was white, and despite looking disheveled, he spoke perfect Spanish. Cabeza de Vaca later recounted, they remained looking at me for a long time, so astonished that they could not speak. The men then told their story of the last eight years. 
At last, the four survivors had found deliverance. Cabeza de Vaca used much of the rest of his life to try to persuade his crown to treat natives better. This pursuit of better native Spanish relations had somewhat mixed results. There was a push, particularly by the religious church, to try to be missionaries towards these natives. The positive was it did contribute to a Spanish mission system that did provide for better native relations. But on the negative side, Cabeza de Baca ended up living the life of a poor man. And I advise you to look for a YouTube video uh, that I was not involved in, by the way, called Whatever Happened to Cabeza de Baca. It tells much of the story of his later life. I'll try to include a link to this video that will allow you to review that. I hope that you will like and subscribe to my channel. Also, I want to um, advise you to check out my video on health and weight loss. And I detail my story and all my hardships with maintaining health. But also it explains my journey to thin. And I want to tell you this story to hopefully inspire you to potentially pursue a similar result should you choose to. Also, I have a video on the Hernando de Soto expedition and I plan future videos for other conquistadors. So please like and subscribe to my channel to get notices on this content. I appreciate your attention and hope you were able to fall asleep or pick up additional information about these conquistadors. Thank you.